Good morning. Good morning. Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to uh, Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Um, before we get there, um, let me remind you to check in. If you haven't checked in yet on Facebook, the, for those who are, who are new with us, uh, we check in on Facebook, and that uh, this month, in the month of July, it's about clean water. Uh, can you hear me now? Was Stoughton hear me before, or do I need to start over again? Good morning, Stoughton. Um, all right, so over the Bible will be the Matthew chapter 12, so in case they didn't hear me when I said that earlier. Um, anyway, so if you'll check in Facebook, that helps us. Uh, we partner with an organization, with a business uh, that has other partners and whatever, and so it allows us to each check in this month. Each check in equals, hello. They think the connectors are going in now. Can they hear me in Stanton right now? Huh? Right? No, I, I, I just, no, we don't do that. I don't know how that deal goes down. The microphone's off, and you say something silly. Hello. Hello. I don't think it's me. See, this is where I need to learn sign language. Ashley, would you up here and just say what I say, and you guys can know what it means. Here, just give me a handheld. Okay. All right. Good morning. Now, it, good morning, Stanton. So I'm assuming everybody can hear me now. If you can't, I'll smile a lot. Anyway, uh, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12. Um, and while you're doing that, if you'll check in on Facebook, we'd appreciate that. If you haven't yet, you can do it later when you get home, whatever it is. Uh, that allows us, our each check-in has some kind of value each month. This month, one check-in is one week of clean water for a family. Now, what that ends up being, it's not like they're walking around with a pickup truck with bottles of clean water and say, well, you only get, you know, four clean water bottles a day. It's we're actually going to be digging wells in villages that don't have clean water. So we're going to be digging wells in places where there is no clean water. Uh, so it's a life, it's like a long-term, you know, how long they figure that a, a well lasts. That's how, that's what we're doing this time. And then next month will be something different. Um, the Carnival Campus check-ins... Um, so far this month have been uh, 1,996, almost 2,000 check-ins. Uh, so that's how many clean wa- weeks of clean water we're giving. Um, and then Staunton campus has been 750. So the cross church total is 2,746. Uh, with, our, with our nationwide partners, it's 97,260. So that's a lot of water uh, that's going to be provided. So um, that's a good deal. All right, also, while I'm thinking about it, um, in the bulletin, you'll notice that we are trying to raise money for a playground in the Staunton campus. Uh, let me encourage you, um, both campuses, to give toward that. Um, the Staunton campus building, if you've never been to the Staunton campus building, it's a small building. There's not a lot of spaces. There is zero extra space. Basically, it's two hallways with some classrooms and a small sanctuary. That's all we got there on there. Um, so when it's time for children to express themselves physically and have some energy to release. They don't have a lot of places to go. So we want to provide a, a better playground system for them. So that's what that's about. So if you could write a check or give some money today, if God's starting to do that, please go ahead and do that. Um, so today's message is your words are powerful. That's the one simple truth today. Your words are powerful. And I want to pick up and I used one of the verses of this passage last week, but today I want to pick up and Um, and use kind of the whole passage. This is Matthew chapter 12, verse 22 and following. When they brought him, and him being Jesus, when they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, in other words, he couldn't speak, um, couldn't see and couldn't speak, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. When the people saw this, they were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? Now, what they were saying is, could this be the Messiah? Okay, so now just get, get, the, get the, the picture for a second. They bring a man to Jesus. He can't see and he can't speak. And then in front of them, Jesus heals him. And it, it doesn't say what Jesus did to heal him, but he was healed. And the guy who couldn't speak now can speak. The guy who couldn't see can now see. That's a pretty cool deal, right? And people are astonished and they're thinking, could this guy really be the Messiah? All right, it's a great day. Until the religious folks got a hold of it. Verse 24. 
But when the Pharisees, that's, that, that's the religious leaders, so it's not just people who attended the church, it's the actual religious leaders. When they heard of this, they said, it is only by Beelzebub, that the, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Now just get your head around this for a second. Now, I would like to tell you this never happens today, but it does. Sometimes, um, when God is doing things, um, whether it be in a local church like ours, whether it be somewhere around the world, it's easy for people who either haven't experienced that, whatever that may be, or whatever, to be critical. To, to act like, well, that's not, that's not God doing that. Well, why is that church growing so fast? Well, that just can't be God. Because growing church, if you're growing a church and reaching people, you must be doing something wrong or whatever the case is. Sometimes it's just simply God. And people will, and this is what's happened in this case, they're saying, well, we're seeing a miracle, and that looked already awesome. But rather than saying it was God, what they're trying to do is saying that it's actually Satan who's casting a demon out of the person. That's what they're trying to say, which makes no sense at all. He goes on. Uh, but when, let's uh, see, verse 25, Jesus knew their thoughts. Now, what that is, is from a spiritual gift perspective, like a, it'd be like a word of knowledge. But anyway, Jesus knew their thoughts. And he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. Now, before I go any farther, when you hear things like, well, I grew up in Kentucky. Kentucky's motto is, um, divided we stand, divided we, uh, united we stand, divided we fall. So when you hear those kind of phrases, a lot of times you hear phrases, you don't realize that many of the phrases you've heard that you've grown up knowing, they actually come from Scripture. This is an example of, him, of, of something that is out in the, in the culture that, he, that came from Jesus. And then he explains it, or he kind of ab- applies it to the situation. He says, if Satan drives out Satan, in other words, they're saying that Jesus is operating on the behalf of Satan, and he's driving out other demons. So Satan's driving out demons. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can he, his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, then by whom do you people drive them out? And what he's trying to say, what are you guys doing? So then, they will, they will be your judges. But if it's by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Now, when he says that, what he's saying is, I am the Messiah, that's what he's saying. Like, if, you, you can make a decision. I'm, okay, this is happening. And it's either God or it's not God. If it's not God, it's demons, okay, fine, whatever. On the other hand, if it is God, then the kingdom of God, the Messiah has come. I am the Messiah. Because they just had said, is this guy the, the son of David? So he's, that's offensive words to them, though you may not understand. In our culture, it may not be offensive, but to them, it was very offensive words. Um, jump with me to verse 30. Whoever is not with me is against me. Now, I need you to get, to get your hands. I'm not used to talking. I, I need both hands to talk. This is, okay. But <clears throat> what he's saying is, is that you have to understand the kind of context. So he's, he's just healed somebody. They just criticized him for healing someone. Uh, he has just said, hey, you know what? You can be your own judge. Either it's God or Satan. But if what I'm doing is from God, I am the Messiah. And then he looks at them and says, either you're for me or you're against me. I mean, just think about how they're processing that information. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. So we talk about every sin is forgiven, every sin but one. Every sin but one sin is forgiven. There's only one sin that God never forgives. Blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't use that word blasphemy in our culture, and I'll explain it here in a few seconds. But here's what, here's what, here's what Jesus is saying to them, because yeah, I want you to understand how offensive this is to them, and it's also offensive in our culture. What he's saying is, from Jesus' perspective, God's doing this. You're attributing the work of God to Satan. You're saying that, you know, you're saying that because they thought Jesus was a cult leader. You know, they thought Jesus was, you know, some kind of demon-possessed or he was some kind of, he was operating the power of Satan somehow. 
And he's saying, you're attributing the work of God, the Holy Spirit, to something else, to Satan. That's not going to be forgiven. That's what he's saying. Like, you're not going to miss this one. Like, you say all you want to say. At the end of the day, if you miss the operation of the Holy Spirit, and I'll explain that a little bit in a few seconds, then there's no forgiveness for that. He goes on. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. Talk about himself. He, Jesus is the Son of Man. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, in words against Jesus, will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Now just process that for a second. So you can say anything you want to say about Jesus, and you'll be forgiven for that. But when you speak against the Holy Spirit, you're not forgiven. What does that even mean? Because that we process is different than that, right? I mean, Jesus is Lord, and Jesus is our Savior, and things like that. And, you know, that... But, but, What's he saying when he says that if you speak against the Holy Spirit, you will not be forgiven? Is he saying, I mean, what's, what's that mean? I'll come back to it. Verse 33. Make a good tree, and its fruit will be good. Make a bad tree, and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. And then in verse 34, he says, you brood of vipers... How can you who are evil say anything good? Now, when he calls them a brood of vipers, that's not just calling them a name. Um, in Scripture, uh, if you go back to Genesis, okay, Satan came in the form of a serpent, a snake, a viper. Okay? So when Jesus says you're a brood of vipers, he's saying you're little snakes, you're little you're little Satans, you're demons yourself. And what he's saying is, is you're controlled by the enemy. You are, you, are the, the, you are the offspring of your father, which is Satan, not God. That's what he's trying to say. So now again, look how offensive this is. I mean, everything Jesus said that was offensive in the Bible was directed toward religious people, not toward far from God people. It's the religious people who had it wrong, who misunderstood who put their religious traditions over the work of God or the word, I mean, the word, the word of God or the, the work of God. Now, let me define blasphemy before I get too much farther. Here's, here's a, a biblical definition of the word blasphemy, and I wrote down my Bible so that I never forget it. It's the deliberate rejection of the Holy Spirit. It's being decidedly against the Holy Spirit and it's the, it's the persistent refusal to repent. So here's what it means. Is that when a person is saved, the only way you can be saved is by the work of the Holy Spirit. If you don't choose repentance, you cannot be saved. Now, again, I, this is a whole different message. I can go forever and ever and ever on this topic. The Bible's really clear you're not saved by works. The Bible's clear that you can have all kinds of good works. You can, you can do all kinds of wonderful things and spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. Now, you may have grown up in a church environment. They taught you that good works were a part of salvation. It's not. It may be the evidence of salvation. It may be fruit of being saved. But good works have nothing to do with you getting saved. That how you know that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your life. If that doesn't happen, then you can't, you can't be saved without it. It just can't happen. Many people, we talked about this a little bit, how you know, there's the, the I believe in my head, the facts about Jesus about God, about the Bible, all that kind of stuff. And I, I'm a good person. I'm a moral person. I, I'm, I do nice things for people, whatever it is. But the Bible says is if you believe in your heart, you will be saved. Not if you believe in your head and not if you're a good moral person. It's when you believe in your heart that you're saved. The Bible is very clear that Jesus is our Savior, but the one who does the work of salvation in us is the Holy Spirit. He's the one who indwells us. How I talk about it here is the only way we know we're saved is not, well, I did this and I did this and I did this. You know, I got baptized, I prayed prayers, I go to church, I give financially, I volunteer to serve. That's not how you know you're saved. How you know you're saved is do, can you point to the work of the Holy Spirit in your life? 
That's, that's, how, that's all you got. If you can't point to the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, there is a problem. Now, either you've grieved and quenched the Holy Spirit, so he's going do- silent or dormant in your life. Because, you know, you can be saved, and the Bible says you can grieve and quench him. You sin against him. Okay? You know, he wants you to do something in obedience, and you so- chose disobedience. You chose to reject that, to procrastinate that. At some point in time, he's not going to keep, you know, you're not going to keep feeling God's presence when you keep rejecting what God's asking. So when God stirs your heart and that kind of stuff, if you don't feel that, if you don't have a sensitivity to the presence of God, if you don't have a sense of God's, it doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means that if you are saved, you have so grieved and quenched the Holy Spirit, he's, he's pulled back. But many times, it's because there wasn't the ever indwelling. There, the Holy Spirit never lived in you. You never were saved. Now, the Bible, and this again, I mean, some of you may have been taught differently. Um, we operate by the, what the scripture says. That's what we go by here, not anything else. Um, <clears throat> so there are people who think you can be, you can what they call lose your salvation. You can be saved, and then you can lose that. And, um, and they'll quote some kind of random verses or whatever that they, they think makes that statement. And, um, and they get, you know, get saved multiple times and things like that. That's a flawed theology for all kinds of reasons. I'm not saying that people who think that aren't intelligent. I'm just saying it's a very flawed theology. Like, you know, what happens if you lose your salvation 30 minutes before you died? You know, I mean, this, that makes no sense, right? There's all kinds of reasons for that. I'm not getting into to why we believe that today necessarily, but it's because of the work of God. It's because of the work of the Holy Spirit. It's called the work of Jesus, our Savior. All those things make sure and again, I could talk about that for a long time, that when you give your life to Jesus, that it never, he never lets go of that. That what you've entrusted to him, he'll be faithful to keep until the day you get to heaven. However, here's the problem. The problem is there's lots of people who said, well, I got saved at six, in sixth grade or my sophomore year in high school or at 24, whatever it is, and, but the life they've lived since then does not evidence salvation. And many times what took place was they did not actually give their life to Jesus. They never repented. They never experienced what it means to be actually be born again. Because that's the scripture's word is born again. They never experienced that. What they experienced was, I don't want to go to hell. So in their mind, they believe that there is a heaven. And they believe there is a hell. And then in their mind, they believe that everybody's going to die eventually. And when you die, you're going to spend eternity in heaven or you're going to spend eternity in hell. And then they made a logical decision that says, hell is bad. Heaven is good. I don't want to go to hell. Okay. And then someone said to them, if you don't want to go to hell, if you want to go to heaven, if you want to get saved, then pray this simple prayer with me. And then they said some kind of prayer, you know, God forgive me and, you know, thank you for saving me and all that kind of stuff. Whatever they said. And I'm a sinner, and I repent of my sin. Because you say, I'm a sinner, hey, if you're a parent, you know that just because somebody says, I repent of my sin, yeah, sorry, I lied to you, sorry. You know they don't necessarily mean they're sorry, you know what I'm saying? Repentance is a change of mind, change of direction, change of purpose, in that order every single time. So you never change your mind. Did you ever repent? The Bible's really clear that salvation and repentance go together. So there's lots of people who are holding on to, I know I'm saved. I can't lose my salvation. Yes, that's true. On the other hand, did it ever really take place in you? Did you ever receive Jesus as your Savior? Or did you just go through the motions of what we call salvation? Pray to prayer, believe in the right information in your head. You got baptized, you go to church, that's what people are supposed to do. But you're not seeing the evidence of the Spirit of God in your life. I'm just going to tell you, if you don't see the evidence of the Spirit of God in your life, it's only one of two reasons. It's either because he's not there or because of your personal neglect of him. That's the only two options you got. You're either neglecting the work of the Spirit in your God, of, the, of God in your life, you're sin, somehow in sin, you're somehow grieving and quenching him, or he is simply not present in you. There is nothing in between. You know, we all love Jesus. Jesus is a great guy, unless he's targeting you to talk to. Like, you know, when he says, you know, when he says, um, 
Um, verse 30, when he says, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Now, this process that first. He's just saying, you got one or two options here. There's no middle ground. You're either with me or you're against me. That's all he said. And how he defined it with me was, are you actually gathering with me? Now, just process the average church, the average church attender. Are we going you therefore in the world gathering? Are we so ashamed of what we call our Savior that we're willing to speak about him, to live for him? And many times, isn't the local church, isn't the average Christian many times the best tool, the best advertisement Satan has for not being a Christian? So just because you have religion, just because you go to a good church, just because you believe a lot of facts right here, just because you're a really good person right here, just because you really don't want to go to hell, just because you've prayed some prayers and you've given some money and you've volunteered some and you've been baptized some and just because you're a pastor of a church, whatever, those things do not save you. There'll be many people who are completely surprised. They die, and they find themselves separated from God from all eternity. There'll be pastors who will spend eternity in hell, separated from God. There'll be all kinds of folks, because they never, ever, ever experience salvation. I don't want you to miss that. The only way you know you're saved is do you recognize the Holy Spirit in your life? Now, whatever it is you do that you call yourself an expert of, okay? I don't care what we're talking about. Um, whatever it is you do that you do well. If someone comes up to you and you say, oh, I do this, I do it well, and they go, oh, okay, I know about that, and then they start talking, you know within seconds whether they're lying or not. You know what I'm saying? Yes? Right? I, you know, just in seconds, you're going, you don't have any clue what you're talking about. Right? And they're, oh, I'm just, I've done this for 25 years. And I'm a, what, what, you, it, it's just seconds. It doesn't take very long at all to go, yeah, you don't have any idea what you're talking about. Okay. It's the same way as a follower of Christ. What Jesus is really saying here is, listen, I'm, I'm talking to you. You're talking to me. You've witnessed these miracles. And the thing that God is doing, you're looking at that thing, and you're saying that's, that you're attributing the work of God to Satan. If God lived in you, you would recognize that was God. See, the Holy Spirit in you, okay, God around you, everyone would call that, you would know. If you, if, you, if you understand God and you know God, okay, when God's doing things, you're going to know that. So when you attribute the things of God to Satan, what Jesus is really saying is that there is no God in you. You're having a hard time recognizing. I mean, if the Spirit of God lived in you, then you would recognize this is the work of God. So he kind of shifts gears when he goes into the verse 33, when he goes into the good tree and, and uh, the bad tree. But what he's saying is, is that whatever kind of tree you are, you're going to produce that kind of fruit. That's, that's what he's trying to say. Um, and he's attributing to them. But I'm going to transition that into how we, how we talk the power of our words. Um, so verse 34 again. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings forth good things out of the good stored up in him. An evil man brings up evil things out of the good or out of the evil stored up in him. Now, again, they didn't see themselves as evil. They were very pious. They were very, they, they followed all the rules. Who, who he's talking to is a bunch of people who followed the rules. That's what they did. And he's calling them evil. It didn't make any sense to call them evil. I mean, not, they're not, they didn't do bad things. But he's not saying you did bad things, therefore you're evil. That's not even a biblical concept. We're not good. There's no such thing as good. We're all evil. The difference is, do we have Jesus living in us, the Holy Spirit, or we don't? 
Different message. I better keep going. Verse 36, but I tell you that everyone will have to give an account for, on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. I'm going to read that again because I need you to make sure you're paying attention. Okay? But every single one of us will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you'll be acquitted. And by your words, you'll be condemned. So what we're talking about today is that your words are powerful. I'm going to try to apply it in a wider range of areas. Number one, our words reveal much about us. Our words reveal much about us. Now, think about words. The words are not just what you speak. They're also what you think, right? We have self-talk. Like, you can sit there. The whole time I'm... You know, none of you are speaking, let's say, while I'm talking on the stage, but you're, you're, you're talking the entire time. You're think we call it thinking, but those are words, right? You're, you're processing information. You can feel things. You're deciding if it's good or it's bad, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to it. I'm not going to check out and not listen to it. You're going through the whole time. You're going through a process, right? Our words reveal a lot about us. I mean, Jesus, I'm using the story again. He, you know, he does a miracle. A really cool miracle. Dude can't see. He can now see. Dude can't speak. He can now speak. Everyone should go, that was awesome. The people said, that is awesome. It says they were astonished. And they started questioning. Could this guy, think about the hope in this, right? The hope. Could this guy be the Messiah? Could he be the son of David? And the religious crowd came right in to steal the hope. Instead of saying, maybe he is. Let's just give time to see what happens or let's see if he's a, you know, can do this long term or whatever the case is, right? Instead of like letting hope be there and then walking through a process to confirm it or not confirm it, they immediately stole it with that's the work of the enemy. That's Satan. That's Satan himself right there. He, the only reason he can do this is the power of Satan. Their words stole the hope that people needed. Where did their words come from? Out of their mind? Because, you know, we understand that your brain, your, you know, well, some people, we, we, they speak before they think, you know what I'm saying? But the mouth doesn't move without the brain operating, right? <laughs> but the point is, what the Bible says is that those words did not come out of their mind. They came out of their heart. Who they are, their personhood. That who they are, what it says is, is out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. So instead of seeing something they couldn't explain, something that was weird, something that was different than them, something that was challenging to them even, something that was like, whoa, I need to take a step back and watch this, whatever the phrase was, instead of that, they attacked it, and it happened to be the work of God. And what Jesus goes on and says is, when you attack the word of God, when you deliberately reject the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, when you choose to deliberately not repent, there is no forgiveness for that. And what he really means is, is that the only way you're forgiven is the work of the Holy Spirit. I mean, we're all forgiven at a cross, but you can't be saved without the work of the Holy Spirit. There's no, you just can't do it. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. So my words and your words say an awful lot about us. Because what we speak doesn't come from our brain, though we think it does. It comes from our heart. out of the overflow of our personhood that our brain processes information and our mouth speaks that information number two in the outline real doesn't have to fake real doesn't have to fake one time this is many years ago now um, I was in a student ministry event and I was telling some kind of story and somehow the story involved me doing 100 push-ups. I don't remember what the story was exactly, but some story. And I had some kids who said that couldn't happen. <clears throat> now, this is a reality. Um, if you can't do 100 push-ups, but you tell people you can, and they call you out on it, you got a problem on your hands. You know what I'm saying? 
You can look good, but if you can't do it, you got a credibility problem getting ready to happen. You should be a little nervous. You should want to get, you know what, well, let's just do something different for a while. On the other hand, if you have done 100 push-ups countless times, and it's not that big of a deal to you, should you be nervous at all? No. Nah. So what do you think Timbo did? We're in the middle of Bible study. I just looked at that kid. You don't think so? I dropped down and did 100 push-ups. And I was winded. I was like, oh, your Bible's with me too. You know, that kind of stuff. But the point is, I did 100 push-ups, right? Well, why did I do that? You, real doesn't have to fake anything. I don't have to manufacture God. I don't, have to, I don't have to convince anyone the word of God is alive and active and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. I don't have to try to convince people that God loves them or God, you know, has a plan for their life. I mean, this, these things are all real. I don't have to be nervous about those things. I, I go on the list. Now, I don't have to be nervous or uptight or fake the work of God in me. I have zero question that I know Jesus is my personal Savior, that when I die, I spend eternity in heaven. And the only reason I know that is because I have recognized the Holy Spirit activity in my life. So if someone says, well, I'm going to go if you're a Christian. I'm like, what? And I've had people say that I wasn't saved. They had reasons why I couldn't. Obviously, I wasn't saved. Like, what are you talking about? Now, if you're Jesus, you just healed somebody, and they're saying, well, that's the work of Satan. Do you think Jesus was uptight about that? He's like, uh... Not only am I the, I am, I am the son of God, right? I'm the, I'm the, I mean, I've been here since before it ever began. I mean, he wasn't nervous or uptight, right? The same thing is true for each of you. He says, if you're a good tree, you're going to produce good fruit. Now, don't think about the word evil the way he says it, because he's, that's not how we would, we wouldn't use that word that way. But if the spirit of God lives in you, you should produce the fruit of the Spirit of God. If you don't produce the fruit of the Spirit of God living in you, if you don't see the activity of the Spirit of God in you, then again, it's one of two reasons. Either he's not there, or you have just really neglected it for a long time. You've been flesh controlled. You've chosen sin, whatever it is, and you've even quenched him. Those are the only two options. Anything less than that or other than that is not a biblical concept. So you don't have to fake what you really are. One more statement past that. When you do fake it, those who are real, they all know you faked it. We have several people as I scan across the room who are in the medical field in some form, okay? And so if you walk up to someone who's a, 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 you know, one of our doctors or a nurse, and you walk up and you try to convince them that you, know, you're, you have a medical education of some nature and you do whatever it is, they're going to, they're going to figure out in about 12 seconds that you are a liar, right? I mean, if you use the right terminology, they're going to know really soon. Right, that you're not shooting straight. Because real nurses would recognize fake nurses. That makes sense? Okay? So a real electrician would recognize a fake electrician. Right? A real musician is going to recognize a fake musician. Right? Real followers of Christ recognize fake followers of Christ. James chapter 3, don't turn to it. I'm just going to mention it for time's sake. James chapter 3, gives it in, well, Jesus gave a, an illustration of trees, good tree, bad tree, good fruit, bad fruit. James, how James talks about the same kind of topic is he says fresh water, like one spring does not produce both fresh water and salt water. That's what he says, right? You can't do, it doesn't make any sense. And he says that the same mouse that praised God shouldn't be the same mouse that cursed God. That shouldn't be true. 
Right? So now think about the consistency or inconsistency of our lives. The same mouth has the power to speak life and the power to speak death, to praise God or to curse God's creation. So if you consider your life for a second, how consistent? Now, I mean, you're not saved. Just process. How consistent is your life with what you say you believe? How consistent is your life is, is how consistent is your life with who you say lives inside of you? Number four, we'll be held accountable for our words. We'll be held accountable for our words. I mean, the phrase, <laughs> the phrase used here is, um, we'll have to give an account for every empty word we have spoken. That's kind of terrifying, isn't it? I have to give an account for every empty word we've spoken. Now, I don't want anybody to have condemnation today. Condemnation comes from Satan, never comes from God. What comes from God is what we call conviction. And if God's convicting you, it'll be very clear what he's saying, and there's always a solution to it, and there's always hope at the end of it. If there's no solution and there's no hope and, and it's, it's, it's like muttered, it's not very clear, then that's called condemnation. That never comes from God. But just think for a moment about the words that you speak or have been speaking. Whether you tell the truth or don't tell the truth. Whether the words are angry not angry. Who are the words are building up or the words are tearing down? Who are the words are filled with negativity, pessimism, fear, whatever? Or they're filled with hope and peace and joy. See, our words are powerful. Matter of fact, um, turn with me to um, Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death. Just process that. How did Jesus, now again, I'm, I, I don't have time to get into all these things, but when if you go back to Genesis chapter one, how did the world? How was the world created? God spoke it into existence, right? God's words are powerful. His word, His written word, His logos is powerful. We are created in the image of God. We can't speak the world into existence. Okay, as, as people who create the image of God, our p words are also powerful. It says in Proverbs chapter 18 again, verse 21, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Now what that means is, is that those who, um, who are controlled by it or who, you know, whatever, and so here's the picture, that whether I speak life or I speak death, that what I sow, I'm going to what? Reap. So if I'm speaking life, I will eat of its fruit. If I'm speaking death, I'm going to eat of its fruit. That, that's what that passage says. Number five in the outline, or no, number four in the outline, is choose to speak life. Choose to speak life. All right, now, let me kind of wrap up with this concept. Last week, we were talking about that shining, to shine like stars in the universe, requires polishing, okay, to get rid of some of the things that, um, that are dulling our shine, all right? And, and one of the clear things that's shown in that passage in, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, or no, verse 14, it says that we're to do everything without arguing, complaining, and grumbling, so that we will shine like stars in the night or stars in the universe, stars in the sky, as we hold on to and hold out the word of life. Okay, now just get your head around that. 
What it's saying is, is that we are to speak life. That a Christian who's speaking death, now, well, I don't ever speak death on anybody. Well, death doesn't mean death as in we stop breathing. There's life and there's death. There's hope and there's hopelessness. There's solutions and there's no solution. As a follower of Christ, we are to speak life. That anyone, anyone can speak death. Anyone can speak hopelessness. Anyone can speak fear. Anyone can speak anxiety. Anyone can speak doubt. Anyone can speak all the things that go with death. And I'm not talking about optimism. Because people who are optimistic, right, they can speak hope. But optimism is a part of your flesh. Okay, being a pessimist or being an optimist are both flesh things. Does that make sense to you? That doesn't necessarily mean the spirit of God in you, right? But whether you're a pessimist or you're an optimist is irrelevant to this conversation. If the spirit of God lives inside of you, then it's about him controlling you. It's about that out of the overflow of your life, that he should be the one who speaks, not you. So if you're a pessimist, that's not a sin, being a pessimist. It's just the way you're wired. But it's a sin to speak death. You can be an optimist, and that'll make you spiritual. You may sound like you have a lot of faith when you're an optimist. Sometimes you're just emotional and it's still your flesh. We're not talking about that. We're talking about that regardless of where you are, that if the Spirit of God lives inside of you. Okay, here's one. How many of you are grumpy and you make comments? If you haven't had your cup of coffee yet, that's kind of your justification for saying mean things. How many of you do that kind of stuff? Come on, bunch of liars. Change the message. I'm sure Staunton people raise their hand because they don't lie down there. But anyway, are you ready? The Holy Spirit's not tired. Now, just process with me. I'm not being weird. I'm just, I need you to understand this. My flesh feels, processes, things. Okay? So when someone does something to me, that makes me mad, then I could say, well, that justified me being mad. I'm mad because of what they did. Does that make sense to you? Well, that's my flesh, even if I, my mind justifies it, and so that I can use my words to speak something less than life to them. I can call them names. I can say bad things about them. I can talk behind their back or whatever the phrase is, Right? Now, is the Spirit of God wounded and hurt because someone wounded and hurt me? No. Do you know who wounds the Spirit of God in me? Or, you know who wounds the Spirit of God in you? Then it'd be you, right? Someone doing something that hurts me is not wounding the Spirit of God. The question is, am I going to operate by my flesh? I'm going to operate by the Spirit of God. So I wake up in the morning, I'm a little grumpy. For whatever reason. I'm tired, I'm in a bad mood, I don't feel good. It doesn't matter. The question is not, do I feel good? The question is, who's going to control me in the moment? And don't be weird. When you are blowing chunks into the toilet, you're not going to be spiritual. Right? Sometimes you're just sick. Right? So don't get weird about that. And don't think, well, if I got the flu, it must be some kind of sin in my life. If I had enough faith, that's, that's silly too. Right? That ain't how it operates. But I need you to understand that what happens is, is that because I'm grumpy doesn't mean I have the right to speak grumpiness around me. But I'm just grumpy. Okay. That's your flesh. I'm not saying it's not normal. What I'm trying to say is, as a follower of Christ, we have an opportunity to live a different way of life. We have an opportunity to do as much as we can to be controlled by the Spirit of God as often as we can, rather than be controlled by our flesh. So when we are afraid, we're going to speak fear. Well, if you're controlled by your flesh, you will. And then we're going to say, but I, I should be, I, I'm, it's okay to speak fear because I'm afraid. In your flesh, you're afraid, and therefore your flesh gives your mind permission, or your mind gives your flesh permission to speak that. I get it. I understand. But as a follower of Christ, I mean, how do you know the Holy Spirit's active in you unless you give him an opportunity to be active in you? 
right? I mean, like for instance, um, I don't have time to tell you. I got a story about when I used to be really an angry guy, right? Like, I had a problem with that. And I remember when I was praying that God would take away my anger, take away my anger, take away my anger, take away my anger. And the short version of the story is that if no one makes you mad, how do you know that God's answering your prayer? Are you, are you, that makes sense to you? So there was a really a severe event that took place where someone deserved the biggest beat down ever, right? They did something. I'm just I, I, I'm making it short as I can. They did something. I had every reason in the world to be mad, and I smiled, which made them matter. Okay? The reason I smiled was I wasn't being mocking toward them, right? I was smiling because I, all of a sudden I realized I didn't get mad. Okay? So, how do you know when God gives you peace if it's not a point, there's not a reason not to have peace? How do you know if God's helping you overcome your fear until you're in the moment where you have an opportunity to have fear? How do you know you're not, or one of the things, one of the things you struggle with, how do you know that God has healed that, restored that, helped you walk through that, answered your prayer about that, whatever it is, how do you know you've dealt with that until you're in a moment when it's time to have that happen? Now, the only way it works is when your flesh is controlled by the Spirit of God rather than your flesh grieving and quenching the Spirit of God. Because your mind is going, you have like the muscle, what they call it, muscle memory thing. You know, like I, when I cut my hair, I used, to have, I used to cut my hair twice a year, whether I need it or not, right? And it's a biblical reason. The only recorded haircut in Scripture caused the guy to lose his sight, become a slave, and he eventually killed himself, okay? I'm just saying. But I cut my hair when I need it twice or not. When I cut my hair and had like, a, you know, an adult haircut, um, I don't know how many times, like right now I'm sweating, I don't know how many times after I had cut my hair that I put my hand right here and flip my hair back. There was no hair to flip back, right? It was just muscle memory. So what happens is, is that we have built-in muscle memory, that whether it's anger or it's fear or whatever it is, we, we have wisecracks, we say. I know some people that are really funny, but what they do is called verbal abuse. Smiley face. Right? Now, first of all, how do you talk to yourself? The only person I verbally abuse is me. That's pretty much true. All right? I can say some really mean things to myself. My guess is most of us are the same way. That we have a tendency to talk down to ourselves. That's not God either. What about your family? The people who push our buttons the most usually live in our same house with us. Probably the meanest things that ever came, that, that probably the meanest things that a husband ever heard came from his wife. And probably the meanest things that a wife ever heard came from her husband. And many times, the meanest things that parents ever heard came from their child. Or the meanest things a child ever heard came from some parents. We're either speaking life or we're speaking death. We do that at the church level. We do that in our culture. Where it be our community, our state, you know, all those kind of things. It's more easy for us to speak death than it is for us to speak life. I'm not saying things aren't bad. I'm not saying things even seem hopeless. But in the middle of all the hopelessness, people need Jesus. In the middle of all the hate, they need love. In the middle of all the pain, they need healing. In the midst of all the chaos, what they need is the local church to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. And the people who have the biggest problems with that are the religious people. Because see, if the Spirit of God lives in you, 
By his very nature, he wants to speak life. By his very nature, he wants to speak hope. By his very nature, he wants to speak forgiveness. I mean, the message that God has entrusted to us is not God is holding your sin against you because you're such an idiot. It's that I am no longer holding your sin against you and I've reconciled you back to myself in Christ. That, that's the message. God does not want you to speak hate. By his, the nature of the spirit living in you, he wants you to speak love. You may hate the activity. You may hate the circumstances. You may hate the sin. But what God wants you to do is speak, live, love. There may be a storm raging. But in the midst of the storm, God wants you to speak peace. And maybe the first person you speak peace to is you. I mean, you can't reproduce what you're not. Does that make sense to you? You're only going to reproduce what you are. So if you're fearful, what are you going to raise? What are you going to create around you? Right? If something happens and I become fearful, all I'm going to do is exceed fearfulness outward. Because out of the overflow of my heart, my mouth is going to speak. So whether I'm speaking life or I'm speaking death, I'm going to enjoy, and enjoy probably all being quotation marks, the fruit of what I'm sowing while I'm speaking. Sometimes what we see in our families, what we see in our churches, what we see in our communities is just the result of what we speak. And if for decades all we've heard is that'll never work, it'll never change. We'll never overcome that. Then it's guaranteed to never change. And then when someone comes in and they speak hope, where everyone's been speaking hopelessness, it's easy to attack that person because they're obviously crazy. When someone says, oh, it can change, when we've been told our entire lives it can't change, it does seem odd, it does seem crazy. What I want you to th process is where are the words that you speak, the things that are coming out of the overflow of your heart, are they a reflection of the culture you live in or are they a reflection of who you call your Savior? Is the words that you speak life or death? Doubt and despair or hope and a solution? Is the words that you're planting, is that really the fruit that you want to eat? If the answer is no, I don't want you to sit there and nod your head and agree and go, okay, whatever. The word is repent. You have to change your mind so you can change your direction, so you can change your purpose. As long as you think it's okay to call your wife names because you haven't had a cup of coffee, then you'll keep calling her names because you have a reason. You didn't have a cup of coffee. If you think that just because your children do something that make you angry, it's okay to call them names and belittle them, then you're going to raise some children who are angry because they've been belittled and called names their whole life. And you know what's going to happen most likely? They might just call your grandkids names and belittle them someday, which is a grandparent you won't be very happy about. See, sometimes what we do is we reinforce in our spouses, our children, People around us, we reinforce darkness and negative things like insecurity and fear. And what God wants us to do is to walk in the darkness and not be darkness. Can you remember we talked about this a few weeks ago, how you, you, know, you can't overcome darkness with darkness? The only thing that overcomes darkness is what? Light. Even the littlest light. The only thing that overcomes darkness is light. And we have a tendency to fight darkness with darkness. It never works. Sometimes it may feel good in the moment, but it doesn't work. So for some of us, maybe what we need to do today is change our mind about what 
comes out of the overflow of our heart. Maybe we need to change our mind about what we give ourselves permission to say, permission to think, permission to do. Maybe we need to take some accountability of ourselves and say, you know what? That's all justified, except that's all my flesh, and that's not the Spirit of God who lives in me. Maybe we just need to repent from the sin of grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit rather than letting ourselves surrender to him so that we reflect Jesus well. Because at the end of the day, it's all about Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, I, um, I realize that uh, a message like this can be hard times. Um, maybe something we have to process for a while. But God, my prayer is, is that in the midst of all of that, that God, what we hear is your spirit. That we don't hear emotion. We don't hear negativity. We don't hear positivity. What we hear is your spirit. There's a really clear voice that says, this is how you need to process this message. This is how you need to respond to this message. And God, my prayer is that we take choices, make, make choices to respond as you want us to. Father, we love you. So just now I pray. Amen.